Our live six battle lounge with the two MK team. Today we are playing Dead or Alive and possibly talking about Guild Gear. Really because this is not going to be a heavily nuanced stream for DOA in the first place, and it's a good chance to highlight the differences in design between fighting games and how it can affect them even with small changes, and why this one for example has different requirements than others and so on down the line. PSN has been having a couple of weird behaviors. We saw some yesterday on the stream for Unist. We're, we think we're looking at another one today. So we're having trouble sometimes connecting to our team members around the Atlantic Rim. This is, in fact, a loser stays on, as you can see possibly on screen right now. Loser stays on lobby. Dead or alive lounges allow you to limit the number of losses before the losing player is shifted off either way. So in this case we have set it to three consecutive and we are now apparently either being booted out or going into a different match than was expected. At least on our side we received Wolf in there but it looks like he'll have to be back later on and we're going into a different match now. Hopefully. Maybe it will connect. Maybe it won't. As mentioned, with the Guilty Gear Strive beta available, those of us who have gotten in as we mentioned on previous streams, but today we have access to the precise way that certain things are going to be working in that beta. We have the instruction manual more or less to tell us what moves characters will have, and other things that change in the availability of things for people as well as some basics of the game mechanics. We knew that there were going to be quite a few changes to the game mechanics for Strive. Some of them meant to make the game more interesting and some of them meant to make the game more accessible. But with games as complex and built up from the ground as Guilty Gear, Guilty Gear is not really trying to mimic any other game. It's a whole thing unto itself and that means that there's definitely some things you can do and see that matter only in Guilty Gear, or only in games that have a similar style to Guilty Gear. If you're not a fighting game fan, it's not always as clear what these tiny changes may be. Some things that may not seem like changes that would matter at all turn out to be big deals, and that's what we're probably seeing. In fact, we were sort of worried about Dead or Alive 6 for precisely this reason. The special button that they added, the ability to hit these specials and use break blow, break hold, it wasn't clear whether or not that was going to massively change the flow of Dead or Alive, and therefore the way that people understand the game. Not necessarily to make the game good or bad, but simply if you liked the game one way, were you likely to have fun with the new version? Well, Guilty Gear has given us a better way to talk about that since it didn't turn out to be that way by our analysis of this game. For the most part, the things that they added were literally just additions. The game's flow stayed basically the same. And in fact, most of the things that you like about Dead or Alive in 5, if you enjoyed it, unless you were more or less a ru complete rushdown Christie made with absolutely no intention of playing any sort of footsies whatsoever. And even those people probably are still fine because they're probably still playing the same rushdown Christie made. And she hasn't really lost her touch in Terrapoon, so we don't think it's that bad. But we've not touched the Guilty Gear beta as yet. We've definitely had people who played it at location tests and minor pokes and had some ideas about what the game would turn out to be like. 
And of course, it is just a beta. There are lots of things in the game that could still change. They made this very clear. Everything from move lists to how you execute certain things and obviously frame data and strength of moves all have the potential to be shifted around in the live version. We know, for example, that they intend to do an entire change to the net code of the game, among other things. So if you're a DOA fan here to hear about DOA, you're only going to hear about it in abstract forms today and possibly comparisons. But because we don't exactly know what to think about Guilty Gear and the timing for a lot of the beta means we're not likely to have it during our regular streaming time. It's a lot more likely that you're going to be hearing about Guilty Gear things, or rather game design, fighting game design things, just you know from the basics of someone who pays attention to them. And the effects that has particularly in the concept of how this game could be very different with just a couple of changes in how things are done or requirements of the player. We expect to see almost all of the usual suspects in lounge today. Once again, this is a US East Coast mostly, but more so Atlantic Rim, so if you're in the Midwest, or down in Texas or the Mexico part, especially if you go to the left, to the east western side of Mexico, you might not be able to get good connections to everyone. Well, we have opened up the second match slot, so you can use that if you want to. And we normally expect to see different people come in and end up talking about matchups if they happen to play anyone that none of us play already.
familiarity with this game, if you're familiar, you will know this game has a throw button. And it has lots of different throws. It's a 3D game, it has throws that can almost all be escaped, but even then, they sometimes end up being command style throws. You sometimes press a quarter circle forward plus throw to get the throw to come out. Sometimes you press back forward and just different directions. Do different throws and these don't always even correspond to what you normally see in 2D games where if you press back and throw you tend to throw the opponent behind you and forward and throw tends to keep them in front. You can't even be sure of that when it comes to Dead or Alive. Guilty Gear was the opposite end of that spectrum for a long time. You will press the heavy slash button in that game from a really close location to throw, and the throws themselves have basically no startup. It's functionally one frame, the shortest amount of time it could possibly take in order to start up and execute the throw. This also means that because the game also had an incredibly small window for hacking the throw, i.e. pushing your opponent off you instead of actually being thrown, you generally had a good chance of getting thrown if you were just defending and nothing else and just decided I'm just gonna sit here and block you can't do anything to me and let your opponent walk up to you without reacting at all chances are you were going to get thrown not to mention the fact that if you did get thrown most characters in that game had some form of combo they could do after the throw This was balanced by the fact that if you were out of range even a little bit, the thing that would end up happening most of the time was that your character would hit either a command normal, depending on which direction you pressed, like forward heavy or back heavy, or if they didn't have one for the direction you pressed, they would just hit their heavy slash, which can sometimes be a safe move. In fact, characters that are meant to be strong in pressure often had such setups, but they would at least push you away from them. So you would manage to get a little bit out of the range of the throw, they would hit the heavy slash button, and it would push you out of the way, you wouldn't have to worry about it. I can see why they were concerned about the lag. Although it is odd to be laggy from that form, so maybe it's something else. Fortunately, this isn't a game where that type of lag matters a lot. So decision making should probably stay up. Anyway, the result is, of course, that if you have a throw button, you are able to control it exactly when you throw, and pressing that button leads to your character's animation being an attempt to throw. A throw whiff. And throw whiffs are a big deal, not necessarily because they're all that punishable, but technically because for many beginner players they're not. A throw whiff is often a hard to recognize animation. And for the usual gameplay, throw whiffs are normally not that long in terms of their animation. They look a lot like just the character standing there and wiggling around. And furthermore, they only tend to have a recovery time approximately equal to a medium kick or something like that. Meaning that unless you could whiff punish medium kicks, you're not really getting a lot out of this. By the time you've recognized that the throw has happened, there's not a lot you can do. You have to be fairly mashy in the first place, and if you thought you were going to be under pressure, you generally weren't mashing out for that reason anyway. If you were defending to the point where your opponent thought it was necessary to throw you, it depends on your timing of course, but you absolutely could just stay that way. You wouldn't be too likely to try to hit a button in that position, especially if the opponent was moving backward, because you'd just get blocked. Depending on your button, that might be good, but well, it depends on whether or not hitting forward plus R1, which is now also the dust button, 
the one that also will the characters whiff a throw, and if so, how long will the animation for this whiffed throw actually be? The result of this is almost always the same though. It's similar to someone doing a hold whiff in this game. And if you was, unless you were continuing your attack, someone whiffing hold in front of you is not an easy way for most beginner players to get anything out of it. Final result is very likely to be the defensive game of Guilty Gear will have changed drastically. The other report is that throws, which used to be, as I said, the minimal possible amount of startup, as opposed to this game where they have literally different startups, like even within basic throws, you have someone's back throw might be 8 frames, their forward throw might be 10 frames, their standing throw 6 to 5 frames, I think there are 5 people with 5 frame throws. And the reach being different, there's a whole complex throw game built into this game. But Guilty Gear has never had a complex form of the throw game. It's just I'm walking up to you and if you aren't really in the position it's bad for me most of the time and at least isn't disadvantageous to you. The throw whiff situation creates a scramble that favors certain character styles of play. In fact, in any game where throw whiffs are a thing, characters with evasive hurt boxes tend to become stronger simply because they do the throw whiff and then do the move that evades their opponent's most likely panic button, the thing they will probably try to hit in order to deal with the situation. Fighter was concerned that it might lie quite a lot and that they'd leave if it did. I'm not really sure how much of that is on them versus on us. We'll have to find out in a bit. But I expect, given the way the game plays out, that it's serious. So we'll see what happens. It's a little odd because, again, normally the bars don't really mean that much in this game. For the most part we find that unless your connection is bad, you could be two bars and it really makes no difference. But inconsistency is a thing that matters. But it looks like they've had it out because it did not in fact turn out all that well. So sorry about that and we are moving on to the next match. So back to our guilty pleasure of this stream, talking about throw buttons. By changing this, you have shifted a fundamental aspect of Guilty Gear. Especially since throws used to be very difficult to tech before. And it usually doesn't make a lot of sense for a game to have throws that have startup, can whiff, but are then very difficult to tech mainly because the normal way you attack a throw is to hit the same button. And that is often a big deal. What this means is that in the defensive situation where someone expected a throw in Guilty Gear, they could be what we call shimmied in a specific way. If you were absolutely sure your opponent was going to throw you, and you were going to try to hit the heavy button in order to get out of it, you not only, you couldn't even do it on reaction, you had to think it's going to happen, therefore I'm going to throw too. And when you think this, 
the result will be a heavy buff almost always, because your opponent shouldn't be in range, otherwise you will get the throw attack. This game has an entirely different system for that, in fact. They do something similar, in that if you try to hit the throw at the wrong timing, too early into your opponent's throw attempt, if you're just going, well I know you're going to throw me so I'll match it. Unless yours actually started before them, you actually get thrown, which is not as common. Many other games make it so that if you throw, if you put in your imp throw, input two or three frames after your opponent put in theirs, it's just okay, you both tried and now it's automatic escape. Whoever pressed it first is at slight advantage. This game seems to have a system where it's not even slight advantage. They just get to throw you and the throw does extra damage and everything. In other words, you're required to some extent to wait for your opponent's throw to actually show itself as a throw before you try to get out of it. You can test this on our various bots. It comes up a lot against Helena bot, which will be hopefully released this weekend, and Itomi bot, which was released as well time ago and you can easily find. The other part of this game is that throws having so many different ways to be done, so many different ranges, so many different startups, means they're often used as punishes in a game where they tend to be faster than full-on strikes. Now this is true in a lot of games. In fact, in almost all games, modern throws are basically as fast as the fastest strike or faster. In fact, I think only Street Fighter is not like that at the moment, that easily comes to mind. Unist also has the same frame data for throws, unclear, that is, as Street Fighter, but it also has slower normals, so you're still at the point where the throw is probably your fastest option, simply because all of your buttons are slightly slower. Even your fastest button on most characters is slightly slower than the throw. Specials can be faster, but normals are generally not. or at least around equal. Guilty Gear was entirely different. You could have normals that start in 5 and throws that start in 1. Adding startup to throws, any amount of startup to a throw in Guilty Gear, changes the game at least a little bit. Now we don't know exactly how much, I think you can probably find this somewhere on Twitter most likely, but we don't want to speculate right now and not necessarily want to check on things because Getting frame data from very basic tests is kind of difficult. There are lots of ways to test frame data to let know if you're ahead or behind in various situations, but the options afforded to the beta players mean it's going to be a little bit difficult to get this test off. And given the beta matchmaking, there are people who are definitely going to find some creative ways to limit it so that they're fighting exactly who they intend to be. But you shouldn't expect a lot of that at first, which means it'll take a little bit for someone to get the data. And unless they're showing the frame data on screen, there's going to have to be a lot of recordings and captures. A lot of specialization is going to go into the little bits of data mining required for this. Since they can change their data, you can't be sure that what you've ever seen in any other form is the we correct but this is a good matchup to reference and talk about exactly this situation. Kasumi is a character who doesn't get good throws because her positioning for throws is often not so great. In order for Kasumi's pressure to act as functional pressure, she's often forced into positions where she can't get a good throw off on you. In fact, there you go. That's usually what happens. The opponent, rather than getting pressured and then thrown, Kasumi uses her speed to get closer without ever attacking and go for the throw before the opponent has any response up to it at all. Since she has such long buttons, you don't want to risk doing stuff when Kasumi is approaching because she might be trying to trick you into sticking out a button she can hit or otherwise mess you up with, and this means she often can get close enough to go for the throw. But you can get used to this really quickly. In terms of design of the character, if you're used to fighting against Kasumi and having her do these approaches, 
it wouldn't be incorrect to say that most of the time, if Kasumi is hitting you, you don't have to worry about her throwing you too much. And if she runs up to you, it's more likely she's going for a throw than anything else, because she has a lot of running moves that have really long startup. She does have one or two moves where she can bait you out get the hit, but these are usually mid-punches. And while obviously this still means you have to do work to counter them and deal with it, you're not necessarily going to get torn apart. You're watching for that moment where Kasumi missteps in some way while attempting to either hit you with a max range attack or land a throw. As a Kasumi player, I can say that I get used to this fairly easily. It's not strictly a problem. She has a lot of nice deceptive moves that mess with your hurt bosses and so on, but this game would fall into the same sort of problem if throw whiffs were a really quick recovery thing. If you could recover quickly from whiffing throws in this game, and your opponent not know whether or not they should hit buttons. Kazumi has lots and lots of nice and basic moves to guess and judge what the opponent's button is likely to be. Figure out where to go from there, and after whiffing the throw with a slow reaction from an opponent. In fact, you don't even have to do it with a slow reaction. <clears throat> you whiff the throw and you hit the next button. There's no good reason not to, except if your opponent has learned to read you to the point where they know that's going to happen. And then they will hold your attack. But if you thought that was going to happen, the mind games come in, you just don't do it, etc. So, yeah. If you have good evasive moves for getting around throws, either because they take you off the ground, or you get to change whether or not you're standing or crouching without worrying about your not actually doing an attack or anything like that. You often have a better chance against this character's run up and throw style of gameplay when she's trying to throw you. She can also play a sort of close range footsies where you're not confident in hitting a button, which will lead to then getting throws. But Guilty Gear is not a game where that's likely to come up. You're not going to see a lot of wiggling around at close range because Guilty Gear moves and the Gatling system often mean that you have too many ways to make sure that you end up safe after your attacks. As long as you've hit the first button, you can chain until you have something safe or you've pushed your opponent out of range enough. And their main options in those cases are actually to use faultless defense to push you out further when they block or instant blocking to change the rhythm of those things. The overall outcome is that you don't get to throw. You don't get right. tricky throw games after this. I cannot lose this. Monica, on the other hand, is a lot closer to the concept of mix-ups in the throws. Monoka can hit you, end up staying close to you, wait for you to recover and stay on defense, and then get a good throw out of the deal. Normally, because she spaces herself in such a way that her throws tend to beat other people's throws. She is subtly good at grappling. When she isn't close to you, and it expects a certain thing to happen, she has some good advantages there. But she has much less of the same type of run up, not fully committed style throw. She absolutely can do them, but because the rest of her threats at mid range don't compare to Kasumi's, you don't really feel that need to not hit a button to stop her from coming at you. In Guilty Gear, the problem is much more character dependent. Guilty Gear characters have a lot of difference in how they flow and play, and throws are not necessarily a really huge part of the game. It's 
It's impossible to go into that in much detail without talking way more about Guilty Gear than anyone whose main focus is DOA is likely to know, but just understand mostly that the concept of approaching your opponent to then go for nothing other than a throw was not common in Guilty Gear before, but could be common now. Mainly because if the opponent thinks to move out of the way even a little bit, the throw previously would turn into a heavy button. A really big committed slow attack. Now, depending on the startup of the throw, it's either going to be extremely effective because it won't have too long a startup, i.e. you quickly move in on the opponent, and I'm not going to go into the myriad ways that Guilty Gear has made it that possible. Quickly move in on the opponent without launching an actual attack. So they're not in block stun, they're just thinking that they need to defend against you. And that means they are in a position to be thrown. This is why we assume that throw attacking must be a thing, and we assume that a throw tech window larger than the previous basically non-existent one that was so small that people could not even tell if it existed. Whether or not that's going to be in the game, we expect there to be a longer one because now the player doing the attempt at the throw is not necessarily risking as much. They are risking a scramble, they are risking a little bit of poke damage, but if the throw has a good payoff now, we'll see. Of course, having a throw button leads to a lot of questions about option selects. OS is a common part of most fighting games, to the point where certain games just roll with it and build in things. This game has H cancels, for example, which are not strictly speaking an OS. Alright then. Let us begin the experiment. But they are definitely a way to change the expectation using a different button. And Depending on your timing, if certain moves whiff, you can get a different option than if they don't. By pressing the same button. This is less likely to be fully true for Guilty Gear in the current form in Strive, but before, there was a lot of ways to option select things so that you made sure not to actually get that heavy button, which was honestly yet another level of skill required to play the game effectively. You go through all of this work to make sure that that risk I mentioned that you were taking by hitting the heavy button. In certain situations at least, you could shift yourself so that that wasn't a problem, it wasn't a thing that you cared about. But we've just seen it demonstrated here. Throw whiffs are usually not animated in a way that causes a player to just react immediately without a lot of training. We just saw Bayman whiff throw twice and then still land once. This is not really because, oh, the opponent doesn't isn't paying attention. It's simply that throw whiffs are not a very reactable part of these games. I think I may need this costume. Guilty Gear has simply more vectors for approaches to be done by. 
In this game, if Kasumi is planning to do this, Kasumi is coming straight at you. Or she has one throw that will allow her to go toward your head and grab you there. That's about it. Those are your main options. Guilty Gear's air dashing mechanics, as well as one or two other things that certain characters can do, mean that you're not going to be absolutely sure of what's happening. Opponents will find a way to get in on you and create ambiguous situations where you don't know whether or not you should defend or attack in a very short space of time, and then of course, they will attempt to throw. So with all three aspects of the throw game potentially changed, it in fact changes the entire defensive flow of that game. The same thing would happen if this game had similar shifts or changes. If you made it so that the throw button was some combination and a whole new option for using that button became available, the game would shift. If you made it so that the player did not really have to decide as much how this worked, it would again shift. In the end, what happens, where this comes from, determines the way that the interactions in the game feel even if all of the characters have all the same moves, even if they have all the same frame data other than the throw, you can change the entire flow and feel of a game by changing that one base mechanic. And this is true in almost all games. You change some basic mechanic and the game morphs. But in the specific case of Guilty Gear, the morph is something that we're a little worried about.
all you've got. Come back when you're strong enough to matter. I don't have time to play games with you. I'm giving this all I got! Last chance to run away. I don't have time to play games with you. Fight!
You had a moment ago. Oh, 
Is that all you've got? Come back when you're strong enough to match me. Other reasons why you're unlikely to get a full-on Guilty Gear Strive stream from us, besides the timing of the beta and our most likely type of content, 
It's simply that, as mentioned, we were going to spend a lot of it based on whether or not any familiar characters or familiar playstyles and characters seem to be available within what the beta does offer. And it looks like there may have been some characters, even characters that we expected to be able to play other than Kai, of course, who may have had some changes to their moves. We're not absolutely sure yet because we can't tell much about moves from their names, especially since we tend to, in the fighting game community, use different names for the moves than they actually have or the pronunciation from the character makes it seem a little bit different. So you're going to get yourself in a lot of situations where the name has some cool specialized move and everyone just calls it something completely different. But so far, it's looking like Chip Zanuff may be missing some of his signature but rarely used moves. This is also important and comes up a lot in games like this. If you take away a tool that a character nearly never uses, it would often seem as if, well, why would that matter? Did No one used it, so you didn't really care whether or not the character had it. But a lot of the time, moves don't have to be used to be a threat. They fill a space that the opponent can't afford to give you enough space to do the move. So for example, if you faced a character who didn't have a lot of zoning but could easily defeat your own in, let's say, footsies, but your character has a power-up that they can use when the opponent is far away, taking that move away changes a lot of the gameplay and the matchup. This game doesn't really contain a lot of that. There are not many characters that get anything even remotely equivalent to a power-up by being far away and just standing there and using some technique to use this power-up. But there are definitely characters who have moves with long setup or stances that they can get into that have more mix-ups than normal, except that you would never be able to get into these stances when at close range or when faced with an opponent who is going to attack you intermittently. This is super important in a lot of games. The idea that, well, I'm over here, I have made sure that you don't have an option to attack me. I have the life lead. What are you going to do now? If a character can use a move that can give them armor, for example, to allow them to go through one hit, it makes approaching in footsies more literally approachable. Helena, for example, doesn't have a lot of uses for just directly going into her Boko stance. Except when at that range, where the opponent is unlikely to attack her because she has superior footsies, they're not expecting to win out there. By having those superior footsies against many characters in the game, Helena gains the opportunity to occasionally use this stance. If you choose not to let her use it, you have to attack and put yourself into the position of having to deal with her options. If you know how to deal with them, that's great, but in general, taking the move away from her means that now the opponent is forced to is not forced to do anything. They don't have to go, oh, well, now I have a character who can stay so low and partially parry me and other things. Reach with that really long range throw she has with punish in completely different ways. Options available to Helena that you can negate simply by sticking close to her, simply by making it this sort of situation where she never has a good timing or a good point for this move. And as you can see, if Helena's not ready for all of your longer ranged options against it, She's not benefiting from doing it then either. She has to have a lot of concepts of how to deal with this in mind in order for this to work. But that isn't to say that she gets nothing, because even then, the opponent is waiting for her to do that, and she could use a different option instead. Part of the reason this may end up being important in Guilty Gear is that if certain moves have been removed, for example, we're hearing that a Faust character has lost what we call the Pogo, 
Possibly. Possibly. This move allowed Faust to do a lot of very specific things that were tricky enough that if you let him get into the stance, you weren't necessarily in any danger, but your ability to approach him was greatly reduced, especially, in fact, more importantly, when you wanted to do so with a long-range attacking special, oddly. Because while the move didn't necessarily offer him much defense against those things, if Faust reacted to you trying it at the correct time, he could knock you out of a lot of things. Chip appears to have lost one or two of his moves, specifically the sort of thing that nearly no one ever used, the ability to, it might still be there, the ability to teleport in particular ways, and the ability to functionally turn invisible. I think he might still have to turn invisible. But if he ha if he's lost his teleport, there is a certain specific form of play, a certain situation you end up in that was very rare at high level, but had its purposes even there. A shenanigan, a mix-up, a trick that you only use once in a blue moon because that's the best way to deal with one very specific opponent mindset. Sometimes that one opponent mindset is the thing that defines whether or not you're capable of doing something. Or Nico. Another stream where I don't end up having a lot to say about characters because we've covered Nico before. Last time I was playing Nico at the time. Nico is a character where, if you really want to handle her, there's a lot of understanding you have to have around the fact that her mid punches have long wind ups and nearly everything else that threatens you is a mid kick. So it's easy enough to understand how to face her in those situations. She does have low kicks as well, but they often to our telegraph and you don't tend to get too hurt for doing them or for letting her do them. So generally, once Nico is close to you and dancing around, if you really insist on stopping her from doing anything, just hold mid kick and hope the best. You see, right there. In general, this will lead to you getting opportunities because your opponent won't want to use certain advancing moves. And that lets you play footsies again. And this is exactly the sort of thing I mean. If for some reason someone were to make even one change to Nico's kick height for specific ones, it would change the entire matchup, not necessarily to make the character unbeatable, but to shift the flow such that you would end up stressed out. And she's stressful enough as it is without any change, primarily because if you're attacking her, she does one set of things. If she's playing neutral, she does a different set of things. She's a very complex and rounded character, leaving you with a constant feeling of, okay, I don't know what exactly to hit here. Partially because most of us are here so used to the idea that once an opponent has hit you with a button, any button, you need to hold mid-punch as their next follow-up. Whereas Nico breaks this. In general, you have to hold mid kick to stop nearly anything she wants. With science, nothing is impossible. But that's the sort of thing where you can talk about character matchups. And obviously, there are some characters that are allowed to be tricky and are functional as tricky characters only because they play so differently than the rest of the cast. The problem with changing mechanics in an established game like Guilty Gear is actually when you do this, you have also changed the game plan of every character in the game in some way. Characters that previously had really good pressure with a threat of a throw mix up but never actually used it because the opponent really didn't want to get thrown and never allowed it, now don't have that threat of the throw mix up anymore and the opponent goes, you know what, I'll just take the throw. We had an entire discussion when Eunice became unclear 
where the entire internet was basically up in arms about whether or not it made more sense now to try to tech out of Wagner throws or let Wagner throw you. Before, as far as I remember, it was always take the throw is Wagner. It doesn't matter that much. She doesn't get that much off of it. The situation is usually in your favor. She gets close too much anyway. Don't don't bother letting her open you up and do massive damage. Just take the throw. And then Apparently there was some small change made where Wagner started to suddenly get a lot of either control or damage from her throw. And this camp became split very quickly and it often became split by character. In the end, I don't think it was completely decided by the community as a whole whether or not you should in general let Wagner throw you or try to get out. And it's not really a matter of let in that sense anyway because it's a focus question. Can you focus on enough of things going on to avoid being thrown? Whereas before, the advice would have been, you know what, don't even bother spending your focus on that. Spend your focus on avoiding everything else that happens, and if she happens to throw you, eh, just hope that you didn't get hit too many other times and your health didn't get torn apart so that the throw started to mess you up. Leifang is like this a lot as well, partially why I bring her up. Leifang is a character where if Leifang throws you, you don't genuinely care that much. You care if she throws you in a very specific situation that gives her a massive amount of control. But mostly, Leifang kind of wants you to tech out of her throw, because it puts her in a better situation than if you actually took the throw most of the time. If the game were to change in some way, such that follow-ups after throws were different, or throw tech was less effective in certain ways, it would change the way Lei Fang players approach their matchups, and it would change how Lei Fang's effectiveness even when she's not throwing, would be demonstrated. So let's actually look at this a little bit again with me being silent for a while, watching specifically this matchup. Because these two characters, when interacting with each other, end up looking for opportunities to throw, but neither gets a whole lot out of the throw itself. You can get quite a lot if you really try hard for Lei Fang. But it's too easy for Ayane to get out of the range of these, to counter a lot of situations, to just hit jab and mess up everything you wanted to do anyway. Similarly, Ayane has throws that Leifang's slower moves don't tend to stop, forcing Leifang to do holes in the same situations. Which again opens her up to getting thrown by Ayane, but Ayane is still not getting that much off of it. Overall, this means neither character has a whole lot of reason to change the way they flow. They found should generally try to hold Ayane's stuff. Because Ayane will not often be close enough to get the throw, and when she does get the throw, you're not terribly scared. You're scared of getting hit and having that hit lead into problems. <clears throat> Similarly, Lei Fang gets to attempt throws a lot because Ayane's moves tend to have longer startup. When she does hit quick moves, Lei Fang goes under quite a few of them. Or if she just was hitting quick moves in general, Lei Fang would attack from further away. So Lei Fang doesn't even need to walk up or dash up and throw. She can just throw after certain interactions, and it turns out a lot better than hitting buttons. 
combine this with the fact that she is one of the better characters in the game at stopping her momentum and attacks to then throw, whereas most characters, they stop their momentum, they wait for the opponent to attempt to hold, they go for another strike on a delay, they found often manages better by just throwing, period. She has a lot of capacity to keep hitting moves and being at advantage. And because she has this ability, the opponent is more likely to say, I'm just going to keep blocking because I know you're just going to keep hitting buttons. And I can't hold half these because you're really confusing. But then she throws and that's why she isn't really allowed to get much throw damage. So while in close, Lei Fang basically just has to hit the throw button and hope for the best. And while far away, then she has to do work. The rest is a matter of prediction and understanding of flow. If you change that flow by changing the throw mechanics such that it was easier to tack out of throws, then Ayane would be in a position where she could just hit throw a lot. There would be no downside to this. If she could do this, if the trolls tacking were similar to in Street Fighter and you didn't have to worry about getting high counter thrown for trying to tack too early then close range Ayane would probably just hit throw all of the time whenever she was close to Leifang because the same outcome would happen. Leifang being advantaged by her heavy buttons would no longer be a valid way to get to do as many throws as she wanted. Would this make the matchup unplayable? Hard to say but if you were enjoying the way the matchup was before it would certainly not be the same type of fun as it was. So bearing that in mind and having similar things happen in this matchup, mostly once again Lei Fan can just hit throw and hit throw and Honoka is not likely to do a whole lot about this. She can usually be in a better position for tacking out of them because of the character type she is. She delays longer between attacks, she doesn't need to reposition as much and think about that, and her kicks can easily set up good situations for her. She's also harder to hold than Ayane is at longer ranges because she doesn't attack as often in the first place. But once she is close enough, Throws as punishes against Honoka don't work as well. Throws as offense against Honoka work fairly well. The question is whether or not she will let you get close enough with those mid kicks she has to actually try it. The way that throws interact with strikes is also always important in these games. If they make contact on the same frame, what happens? Does the hitbox matter? Does the move done before matter? How much does block stun matter? Can the character be in a state or a crumple where the throw won't hit them even though technically a strike would? And can this be done off of a guard break where you technically were still guarding? All of these little things matter a lot. And in this case, let's start watching for a while, in general, how the interactions between the throws, because Lei Fang is often going to have to use them differently in the matchups you can see for the rest of this lounge. And furthermore, the actual attack she uses to follow up the throws, because as we mentioned, she doesn't innately get a whole lot of damage or advantage from doing the throw in itself but rather a lot of the time she has to get a very specific follow-up to it or mislead the opponent in some way.
Helena being a different problem because Helena doesn't actually have to let you get close enough in the first place to do the throw. She has long footsies. You have to evade her first and then do it. And similar things come up. But that looks like three losses, so we're rotating out now, probably. We'll see what happens now then. But bear it in mind for when we see that matchup type return. Don't have time to play games with you. I'll fight you, Miss Helena.
how strong you are. I cannot lose this fight.
will do my best. I cannot lose this fight. When you're fighting an unfamiliar character that you either haven't encountered before or just haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with, or in the case of uh, the Guilty Gear beta that we were discussing and this whole new Strive thing, starting out a new game or a new variation of a game, uh, it can sometimes be a little overwhelming in terms of all the different things that you need to learn about the characters that you are facing. Um, obviously, especially for characters you have no prior experience with, but honestly, even some of the ones you're familiar with, if they've changed something and you're not aware of exactly how it works or didn't even know about the change, you're going to miss things and it can be very confusing. But in the end, you have to have some way to get through this and learn about the characters. And you can do that through a lot of, well, experience, getting beat up, trying things, having it not work. Um, but it can be hard, at least in my experience, to sort of aggregate that experience. And different types of people will have different, well, experiences on the matter. But one way that is relatively effective for learning how people work, how other characters work, is to just block. And you might think at first that, wait, if I just block, how's that going to help me? But if you're in, like, just general online matches, or um, playing a beta that sends you to random people, 
they're not going to expect you to be only blocking, and the idea isn't even to only block, but to focus on blocking first. Because this will give you, obviously, an idea of what moves you can and can't defend. But there's also a lot of other subtlety that gets involved in terms of seeing how your opponents try to approach you, what buttons they use at what spaces, how they try to open you up, where they want to stand, um, basically in footsies, how players of different sorts of characters or different styles of those characters respond to, um, well, not having you doing a bunch of stuff to them. Because, I mean, to take Street Fighter for instance, uh, Guile and a Ibuki are going to have slightly different reactions to this, if you can imagine. Just because of the types of players that tend to play the different types of characters. And obviously if you only block, you're just going to get walk-up thrown a lot, eventually. But you don't need to only block. You can simply block have a situation that occurs because of this, and there will be somewhat more limited situations than constant exchanges in neutral, and then get experience just to start off immediately with those particular situations. There will be a few of them, but for any given character it won't be as overwhelming as trying to learn everything at once, and you'll soon become comfortable with that and be able to respond to, say, my opponent, opponent is coming in from this range, they tend to use these buttons for that, or my opponent has hit this thing hoping to open me up, I bet I can respond with this, and it gives you a good foundation to build yourself up from. Which can be very helpful if you're feeling in any way overwhelmed or uncertain, or just needed a place to start from other than everywhere. Neutral and um, even like pressure, block strings, all the other components of fighting games don't provide the same experience, in part because there's constantly things going on. Blocking is one thing, maybe not exactly one, but still it's a very limited, specific, focused thing. Whereas if you tried to do this just in neutral or just having general experience trying to fight a character, you're in all sorts of different states. You're at this position or that position, your opponent has just hit this button, their mindset is in this place or whatever, or you've hit this string, but your spacing was a little bit different than the last time, and your opponent will obviously have different responses to all these different situations, or their responses might even just work differently depending on ranges, or what state you're in or they're in or just how their reactions happen to be at the moment. So, you can certainly learn by experience this way, but it's going to take a lot more experience to get a basic foundation than starting from block. So, that's basically the easy way to go about it if you are feeling uncomfortable or don't know where to begin. Get ready.
something you do, um, basically focus on blocking and learning your opponent's moves. It a sort of gives you an interesting opportunity because um, there's something in fighting games that we've talked about, that other people talk about, that is the one player versus the two player game. And in the beginning, a lot of people tend to want to sort of learn combos, setups, whatever, learn to play the one player game to start with and see how far they can take them they can take themselves with that um, and obviously do all that whole winning thing but that's the thing if you focus on blocking and learning your character your opponent I mean it's gonna get hard if you're uh, too concerned about winning but it has the interesting benefit where your opponent will effectively teach you how to play their character, or play the one-player game of their character. Because if that's the state that many of your opponents um, start out in, or that's what they are trying to do, get their combos, get their setups, get things going in that way, then they're going to continue doing that. And you get to see basically a mini lesson in, okay, how do you play this character? You're going to see how they approach you, what they try to do, um, what sorts of combos or pressure they use, whether they try to um, bait you out into footsies or other such things. This is your last chance to run away. And in, in the meantime, you're getting to see... No, I don't think that move works. Does that really work? Or things like that? As you figure it out, and obviously, that's very easy to test. If you don't think something that they're doing in their one-player game works, counter it. Either you're going to um, find out, nope, yeah, I was right, that doesn't work, or you're going to find out, huh, they can do that. Interesting. And either way, you've learned something about their character, and the way to play them, what they can do, etc. Or maybe you do it a couple of times and force your opponent to stop doing that move as much or such, make them second guess it, and get to learn what their game changes into when you take out that part of it. And there, once you begin that sequence, you're starting to do that whole developing a matchup thing, and learning how to fight a character for real, building up the layers of what needs to happen to make sure you, not your opponent, end up being the one ultimately in control. And start slowly spreading into the, well, two-player game.
don't have time to play games with you. Go away.
back when I fight. I'm giving this all I got. Come <laughs> on. 
back when I fight.
I cannot lose this fight. So sorry, but this fight is mine.
Captain had a moment ago. I cannot lose this. I'm giving this all I got.
is your last chance to run away. I cannot lose this fight. back when I fight. I cannot... Hey! 
happened to all that spirit you had a moment ago? Alright then, let's go. Alright, we've been at this around the normal amount of time that we put into these lounges. And of course people have other things to do even in a pandemic, so we are going to have to move out. If you have watched this stream, we realize we've mostly talked about Guilty Gear until Kansuki Dynasty was on to talk somewhat about experiences and little things you can do that apply to both this game when you're first starting out. And, of course, two Guilty Gear Strives beta coming up within the next few days. Once again, we may not be streaming that. We don't know what type of content you'll get tomorrow. We don't know if it will be later than usual. That's the likeliest thing given that the beta's main things that we would be checking and getting opinions on come up after our standard stream time, starting at what I believe is 8 o'clock Pacific time, i.e. 11 Eastern. We might still throw off a stream at that point, but don't expect it around normal time at all. And we've already said a lot of what we have to say about the game. We also expect there to be a big uproar of certain types based on this beta, and a lot of information that people will want to change, or tell the designers to change, and a lot of it has an option to be changed meaning that anything we stream about or say relative to the beta would be based on those same sorts of interactions and assumptions. We aren't going to know whether or not anything in the beta is going to make it into the final game basically at all other than characters and probably their main playstyles. But with a lot of expectations for changes in different directions, you can basically be sure that we're going to have at least opinions and hopefully the stream will turn out to be only opinions and not anything anyone ever uses for straight up understanding. That said, therefore, this brings us to the end of this stream. You can join us next week at the same time for more Dead or Alive action. On Monday, we will be having our Mission Mashing Battle Lounge for Street Fighter V. And on Tuesday, probably, we will get some more of the Tuesday train with Undernight. That brings us to the end of tonight's stream, though. This has been really in Kansuki Dynasty. The whole team playing some Dead or Alive 6 and talking about Guilty Gear. Good luck with your training and good night, everyone. <laughs>